can start taking questions. Yeah, man, go ahead. Hey, Shuhan, Nadi, and Hotel, thanks for the uh, great talks. So mm -hmm. I have a question about this is a simple XY example, yeah. just to make sure that I understand this uh, Berlin formulation. So the phi and phi tilde, uh, I can think of them as basically uh, the, the conjugate variables, right? And phi is, the phi tilde is conjugate to phi. Is that correct to? I think say? conjugate might not be the right wor word, but they are dual to each other, certainly. Um, well, I guess in this, no, Euclidean lattice way of writing a theory, it's not entirely, it's not quite right to say that they are conjugate, but um, just that the way that the two symmetries act on these fields, uh, it's exactly the same as you know, the conjugate variable of, like in the continuum theory, I can also write the usual U1 boson using phi and its conjugate variable theta. Uh, and yeah, yeah. If you have in mind phi and theta in the Lottinger liquid, right. yeah. But it's not a conjugate in the sense of, you know, in quantum mechanics, we have X and P and they obey the Heisenberg algebra. It's not conjugate in that sense. But, but theta uh, are conjugate in that sense, right? But it's, it's phi and B, X and theta that are conjugate yeah. them, right? Right. You have to take certain derivatives to make right. that statement right. precise. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, uh, phi is a circle value field mm -hmm. and its conjugates should be an integer value field. Right. But here, importantly, both phi and phi tilde are circle values, meaning that they have two pi periodicity. Yeah. I mean, this is, of course, a nice feature because no, no that's what we saw all the time for phi. And Theta, but now you put it on lattice. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly the point. Right. Um, I'd like to add here that the intuition that you mentioned, Monk and Dominic's answer, can be made very precise on the lattice. So in the continuum, you say that the time derivative of phi is the same as the spatial derivative of phi tilde and vice versa, maybe with a minus sign. There's a similar formula on the lattice, and which you can see hidden, it's not quite explicit, or the point, Chuhan just moved the pointer because he anticipated what I said. The two currents exist on the lattice, just as they exist in the continuum. And going from one to the other, you just swap phi and phi tilde. And since the current is a good operator, you get an operator equation between d phi and d phi tilde. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, great. I think um, Ethan's the next question I see in my list. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. This, this might be kind of an annoying question, but uh, if if we if we take the x y plaquet model and we add a add cosine of delta x phi uh, with a small but non-zero like small but not infinitesimally small coefficient, uh, does that change the IR physics of the model or uh, or not? Yeah, so first I will say that in, in this talk, um, at least in this presentation of the talk, we only discuss the symmetries and, and of the model. And on the lattice, in either lattice model, we have the momentum symmetry. So one option is to impose that symmetry. Your question is that, you know, we don't want to impose this symmetry. Let's break it by adding this nearest neighbor interaction. Yeah, so the interesting question. And I think it really depends on uh, what we mean by uh, the relevance or irrelevance of this operator. What we mean by whether this operator preserves the phase of the model. The, the la this XY plaquette lattice model is a rather unusual gapless space because there are different kinds of modes with different, that they, uh, these two different kinds of modes, they go, both go to zero energy as you take the uh, infinite volume limit, but they go to low energy at a very different uh, rate. And I think there's a question about when we say this op deformation is relevant or not, whether we only focus on the lighter states or do we look at all of them? Mm -hmm. And for one, uh, a definition of the question, this was addressing 
the original Paramaconti et al. paper, where they include all the operators that go down to zero at low energy. And in that case, uh, I believe, uh, in that case, uh, the answer will depend on the lattice coupling. But you can, it's also natural, especially from a continuum point of view, to only look at the lighter state, and then the conclusion might be different. I'd like to add something here. Uh, instead of getting into all the details, let me give you a, a shorter answer, which are the details of which Shuhen just outlined. You could ask the question uh, when you perform this perturbation, as you perform, as you mentioned, uh, does the system remain gapless or not? Mm -hmm. Is that a recharacterization of your question? Uh, does it remain gapless? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. But then the answer is yes. It remains, it's robust against this deformation. It remains gapless. But the modes that remain gapless, there are two kinds of modes in the infinite volume limit. Some of them remain there and others are modified by the deformation. Mm -hmm. This is an unusual situation to, to normal, normal view don't have. The, when you, usually when you take a limit, the only the, the light modes which are gapless and they give some CFT and the rest is gone. And so if you look only at the lightest modes, this model is robust. If you include also other modes that go to zero, then this, is, this conclusion is not true and these other modes are lifted, but the model remains gapless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question I see in my list is Myson. Okay, thanks. So thank you all for the very nice and very clear talks. So I have a question for Xu Hang. I'm intrigued by the fact that you um, were able to have a lattice model that exhibited this mixed anomaly. Yes. Usually we say um, that if you have an anomaly then the system has to exist at the boundary of one higher dimensional system or it has to, the symmetry has to be realized in a non on-site fashion. So here you realize a lattice model with an anomaly, I guess the way you got around it was by having a Euclidean space-time lattice. Is that like how you got around the usual obstruction? Uh, in other words, would there be an obstruction if you tried to turn this into a quantum model in continuum time? And um, a related question is, when can you resolve a two-hoofed anomaly in this way? Can you always res re resolve a two-hoofed anomaly in this way by going to a space-time Euclidean lattice? Yeah, uh, so there are really two questions here. So yeah, so first of all, you see that I, I choose the word locally on the variables because I think the notion of on-site um, uh, in the condensed matter literature um, might mean something different than what we have here. And we didn't analyze this model in the Hamiltonian picture. And um, I think when we go to the Hamiltonian, I, I wouldn't make any statements on whether the Hilbert space is tensor product structure and whether the two U1s really act on site or not. But as a Euclidean lattice model, the two symmetries certainly act locally on every variable. Yeah, so the short answer is that we didn't really analyze the Hamiltonian model in detail. I see, I see. And as to the second question, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And indeed, this anomaly uh, can be canceled by a two plus one D uh, bulk SPT. It's a SPT for U1 cross U1. And actually, I, I don't know if Hota wants to say a little bit more about that because I think he thought about presenting that in the talk but decided not to in the end. Yeah, Hota, do you want to comment on that? Yes, so uh, so this mix of two phenomena should be canceled by certain uh, U1 cross U1 SPT. And that U1 cross U1 SPT can be sort of, so let's call or the gauge field A and A tilde. So we can cancel that by one over two pi, A tilde DA. So that, that would cancel the anomaly. But so is it fair to say that if you did go to a Hamiltonian picture, you would expect that the symmetry would actually be non on site or, or that, yeah, I guess not. Yeah, I interject here about, so they both gave beautiful answers, but I find this, term on-site in Hamiltonian be a little bit puzzling. 
because consider a system in quantum mechanics. So you would, would you say that everything is on site because there's only one site? Yes. And in quantum well, mechanics, anomalies are always very common. Mm -hmm. a, the simplest example is a two-level system with vanishing Hamiltonian. So a two-level system with vanishing Hamiltonian has a global SO3 symmetry, mm -hmm. which is realized projectively on the Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is in the two-dimensional representation of SO3 global symmetry. So it's realized projectively. And this is very common. This is known from Wigner that it, he didn't call it anomalies, but the fact that the Hilbert space realizes the symmetries projectively was true there. So in quantum- when, pe when people make the statement that uh, anomalies require non-on-site symmetries. There is always an implicit caveat to that, which they mean in spatial dimension greater than or equal to one. So it doesn't include this, this example you're discussing, quantum mechanics is an exception to that statement, but it's the only exception really. If a spatial dimension greater than one or greater than or equal to one, it should always be non-on-site. I, I spent a lot of time discussing this with condensed matter physicists and the definition keeps changing. And that's why I really like the way Shuheng handled it, avoiding the word on site. The thing is completely local. There's a local action. Uh, there's complete local action on the fields. And the symmetry, the anomaly is there because the Lagrangian density is not invariant. I think that this is an invariant way of phrasing it. But so, I mean, the, the notion of not on site versus not on site is also an invariant way of saying it. You have some lattice model, the Hilbert space decomposes as a local tensor product. And you ask whether the symmetry operation is basically a depth one quantum circuit that decomposes a tensor product. That, that might, or might it might be worth trying to see going to the Hamiltonian formulation of this particular system. Mm -hmm. This system is very easy to analyze, and the anomaly is manifest, and the symmetry is manifest. So I don't think anybody is going to argue that what you see on the slide is wrong. Right. The symmetry is there, the anomaly is there. You can couple it to gauge fields and see. And you can try and go to a Hilbert space, a choose a gauge and, uh -huh. and make time a continuous. But I don't see why this is a going to be so, so essential because Euclidean system with a Euclidean lattice can be thought of as being a way of describing the transfer met in the transfer matrix formulation. This is the way of thinking of the Hamiltonian formulation. So we can argue what one means by the term on site and different people might have different definitions with different qualifications. But I think the statement is, is true. It, I agree that it would be nice to try and take this to run this system and as, as is and, and uh, describe this phenomenon in a Hamiltonian formulation. I think this would be a useful thing to do. Can I make an additional comment? Um, so there's an old paper by uh, Senke and collaborators in which he showed that a wide variety of SPTs can be described by nonlinear sigma models with theta term, which in turn implies that the boundary theory can be described by a nonlinear sigma model with western mean term. term. Um, uh, now, on, on, in the symmetry, it's just transformers of the, 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 the sigma model field. So, you know, at the level of the action, it looks like, quote unquote, on site. But it's certainly the case that if you can, if you complete the Hamiltonian of this western the wooden model and have a symmetry acts on a Hilbert space, it will be not on, not on site. Um, so probably something similar will, will happen here. Um, I'd like to add something then to my understanding of the on site issue is that there's an obstruction to coupling the system to a gauge field. Because if the action is on site, you just add gate fields in a standard way by adding link variables. In this obstruction to adding gauge fields exists already here. You can add gauge fields on the lattice. So here you can add the gauge fields, but the Lagrangian is not gate, the, and even the action is not gauge invariant. That, that's the source of the problem. So if you try to, to take this lattice action as is and introduce gauge fields for these momentum and winding symmetries, then you can write the coupling. I don't know whether any of you had the slide with the formula. And you can see that the result is not gauge invariant already on the lattice. Can you just make one more comment? I think what Dom, Dominic was saying that 
uh, there's a difference between local action on the fields, fields transforming locally, uh, versus the on-site symmetry because letter usually means a symmetry transformation operator has a particular structure. Um, of course, to define it precisely may you know, may need some may may not be that easy, but I think there's difference between these two things. Well, I, I think that's the reason why I chose locally. <laughs> The term locally here instead yeah, of on-site because I think different people might have different definition of the English word on-site and we can <laughs> yeah and I think in some references it's it's defined very carefully very precisely and then I think I I, I agree um, uh, the the symmetry will be non anomalous following those precise definitions in some other literature it's defined uh, rather um, less precisely and then then there will be room for ambiguities. But here I use a different adjective just to avoid uh, this uh, confusion. Yeah, and it seems like the, you know, a common feature is that you know, in Hamiltonian formalism, if you, like in the example of uh, nonlinear sigma model that Dominic mentioned, or even just for this U1 boson, if you write it in terms of phi and theta, is you know, a pair of dual variables. Uh, in Hamiltonian formalism, it, it also looks like the action is local. Right, no, it's exactly the same action as you wrote on this slide on the you know, Hamiltonian formalism. Um, it's just that these two fields are not, uh, well, they are dual variables. So you know, there's some kind of slight non-local algebra between them. So I guess one can probably ship these two things. Either you make the symmetry transformation completely on-site or you can hide it, oh, you can hide it in the commutation in algebra of these operators. I'm, I'm sure that's a correct way to think about it. But I think in the Euclidean picture, uh, the way we phrase it is also uh, equally nice. Um, yeah. Here, the obstruction of coupling this Euclidean lattice model to the two background gauge fields is precisely because of this uh, uh, comment I, I made here, that the local Lagrangian density, the summand, is not invariant under the U1 cross U1, but only the the, the action is. Can I make a question or comment about that for other people talking about this definition of on-site that we usually use in lattice systems? Don't we usually require that the symmetry commute to each term individually in the Hamiltonian, not yep. with just the sum of all of them? And that's exactly what's happening here, right? Like maybe that's an important part of the definition. I mean, the symmetry commutes with the whole Hamiltonian. That's the definition of symmetry. I mean, it definitely has to commute with the whole Hamiltonian, but usually we require it to commute with each local term. We need to require that it commutes individual term, term by term. Well, we don't have a Hamiltonian at the moment, so maybe yeah. we have to defer <laughs> if we the turned question. It into that's right. Yeah. 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 If this we is just a Euclidean yeah. action. <laughs> yeah. But if we, I mean, you, you can have the same thing happen in a Hamiltonian. You can have set up a Hamiltonian where things don't commute with the terms individually, but with the whole Hamiltonian. I don't know if that's an important aspect. I think it's quite significant. I think this is just the translation of this slide to Hamiltonian language, is what Dominic just said. Dom's just said to avoid any confusion. So uh, the Hamilton, I believe what's going to happen here is that the, every term in the Hamiltonian will not be separately invariant under the symmetry, but the full Hamiltonian will be invariant, which is good enough to be an obstruction to straightforward gauging. But no, I, I, I also believe that the symmetry operator will be not on site. Um, so yeah. maybe that's what happens in these western wooden models, which have a similar property in the Lagrangian, so. I mean, and, and symmetry commutes with Hamiltonian term by term does not really mean that it's not anomalous. Um, even in the case of anomalous symmetry, I can still write down Hamiltonian in this lattice, in some lattice models where like each term is, you know, invariant under this anomalous symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it shouldn't really need to involve Hamiltonian to discuss. Uh, it does seem important, right? Because if we had a symmetry that's on site and the Hamiltonian each term doesn't transform under it, then how are you going to apply the gauging formulation to an individual term? You could apply it to the whole operator, but that's totally well, non-local. You might need to enlarge unicell or do something, but... Yeah, but imagine like no, you know, you can't just like coarse grain a bunch of Hamiltonian terms to make a coarse grained local term symmetric. If you can't make any of the local terms like symmetric, 
how are you going to you know gauge them with your prescription so, the sorry, is there actually such a situation ever where you can, where there's no way to redefine the terms so that they become each invariant yeah maybe we're speculating too much i mean maybe that can't happen with an on-site symmetry <laughs> maybe that means the symmetry has to not be on-site Okay, um, should we move to the next question? Unless anyone has a last comment mm -hmm. on that. Uh, I think uh, let's see one more question from Alexander. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, thanks to all three speakers for very clear presentations. Uh, my question is probably to Shu Heng, but uh, it's more like a historic comment and then a quick question. Uh, so the, in 70s and 80s, there was a question of how topological uh, defects, uh, what's the role of topological defects in phase transitions like XY model. Uh, in XY model, it's clear that it's driven by decoupling of topological defects, but in classical Heisenberg model in 3D, for example, this was a real question. There are hedgehog defects. And the question was whether for phase transition in classical 3D Heisenberg model, uh, there is a um, role of, of these hedgehogs. And there was some early simulation by Kamal and Murthy where they suppressed hedgehogs by in, in, in Monte Carlo, I think. They just basically for, forbidden uh, uh, hedgehogs and, and it turned out that there is no phase transition in that case. Mm -hmm. But if you allow hedgehogs on nearby sites, then there is a phase transition, but critical indices changed. So if you really want to follow this story, there was more recent, but still already pretty old paper by Matrunich and Vishwanath in 2000s, I think, uh, where they did better simulations, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is basically whether you tried to do the construction that you did with suppressing uh, vortices in XY Belain model, but for non-abelian case, like in, in classical Heisenberg model, and what would you expect there? Uh, in our paper, we only look at the XY model and the U1 and various ZN theory. Yeah, uh, th there are certainly other models we can look at, but uh, we didn't analyze all of them. Okay. I think I think I think maybe 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 this can be uh, uh, one way to think about it. For example, for example, actually uh, uh, to suppress some topological defect, it's better to. Uh, Go to the dual picture whether the uh, topological defect become uh, becomes a point particle so you can uh, maybe suppressing the defect is cor correspond to eliminating some terms or put some constraint on the terms in the dual picture so so in this uh, xy plug a kind of model uh, whatever you want to call it uh, go to the dual picture is actually not not hard it's still the same theory maybe uh, suppressing some defect just correspond to uh, forbidding some terms in that theory, I mean, in the dual picture, in the dual theory with a fine tuned, uh, I think I think this uh, this should not be hard to answer. Just depending on how you want to uh, suppress it, we just uh, look at the dual theory and see uh, what kind of terms are uh, forbidden. But, but but so even the defect suppressed by the U one killed our symmetry. Yeah, exactly right. And yeah, the nine not forbidding. It's not forbidding terms. It's actually removing terms, which is not the same thing. If you dualize either the ordinary x y or the XY plaquette model, the dual field is an integer. And what you want to do is to make it a continuous field, not an integer field, but a continuous field. Once you do that, you can restore the vortices by adding a cosine of this field so that the minimum would be, uh, the minimum of, will be effective, will make it effectively an integer. But so that's why the using, suppressing the vortices in the dual picture is not, is not so easy. And whatever you will do, I believe you will end up with exactly the same formulation as here. I also want to make a comment about the previous comment about going to higher dimensions. So it's not the model that Alexander mentioned, but you can do the same thing in the U1 gauge theory to plus one dimension. And it's straightforward to suppress the monopoles in that case using exactly the same formulation as here by going to VLAN and using this modification of the VLAN action. And then the resulting lattice model is very similar to what high energy physicists call the 3D continuum U1 gauge theory. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a clarifying question about the model? I missed a little bit. So on the slide just above, 
Uh, no, the slide where there's a beta term, just one back. Yeah. What happened to beta? So like for going from, are you taking a beta infinity limit or? Uh, no, no. I'm holding the lattice coupling fixed in this discussion. This is a lattice model. I'm not taking any limit. Okay. So you're always at finite beta, but then somehow the final model you wrote down did, did not have the beta term. It looked like. Well, wait, the final model is this one and it has beta and beta zero. Yeah. I see. Okay. So this is the final model. Okay. That's the final model. Okay. Somehow I missed the second term. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Thank you. So Senka had another question in the chat. Do you want to ask that? Oh yeah, I, I well, I just I just want to uh, I just want to uh, uh, extend the discussion a bit more, and because actually, uh, uh, I think I think I think uh, Frank's talk introduced a new model. Uh, it's it's a uh, Yoshida's model plus transfer field. I mean that that uh, I mean the fact that they found a continuous transition. That I mean that is very interesting to me. I I think uh, I wonder what would be the uh, uh, the useful effective field theory description for that. I mean, I, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know uh, how to think about this actually. I mean, a uh, useful effective field theory would actually uh, produce the correct uh, scaling of the three point function. And also, and also show that any two point function actually is, uh, is zero. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just an extension of the, of the discussion. Uh, uh, Mr. Which model are you referring to? That's uh, uh, it's uh, it's a triangular lattice with uh, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z on all the uh, upper triangle, not on the down uh -huh. triangle, and then plus a uh, transfer field. Uh, yeah. So uh, so in the uh, in the phase where there's three sigma z term product is large, actually you have a uh, kind of like a uh, uh, order, meaning that uh, the three point function of the sigma z. As the three corners of the uh, uh, of a fractal triangle has a non-zero uh, expression value, but when the transfer field is very big, actually uh, uh, this uh, correlation actually uh, will decay exponentially, or, or or some some other or some some other way. Uh, so mm -hmm, this uh, mm -hmm. and they found yeah. this uh, continuous transition, meaning that well, in in terms of their simulation, they found a uh, transition yes. where yeah. the energy yeah. density has a yes. Uh, yes. 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 strange power. So. So, so, so I wonder, you know, so with all this, uh, I mean, that, that is more like a type two instead of type one, uh, if, I, if, I, if I understand the word correctly. So, yeah, so here, here actually, uh, so for all this applied kind of a model, uh, it's a two plus one dimensional system, but actually a subsystem symmetry is more like a one plus one dimension. So actually we can more conveniently introduce a, uh, like partial x, partial y, phi square term, this kind of term to actually uh, uh, make it uh, have a, uh, a one dimensional subsystem symmetry. But actually in that, uh, in, uh, in that model where the uh, uh, subsystem uh, conservation is in a fractal dimension, yeah, it seems pretty challenging to write down anything uh, similar. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't thought about that model, but Frank or EG is here, maybe they have more intelligent things to say. But we, we, we certainly should. didn't discuss that model in our paper. This seems like an interesting direction, but maybe we should cut this off here and take it offline. I think it's time for the next session. Um, and I'll oh, hand over another, to whoever uh, There's another section? Sorry. Sharing I, that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. Sorry. Oh, about we that. Could, yeah, <laughs> come back to this later. Great.